Helen Arvanitakis is the Director of Design District, a 15 plus year veteran of the London design sector from a three generation architect family. She's renowned in the design industry for her expertise in strategy, process and people. In her current role at the Design District, Helen is spearheading several initiatives aimed at truly supporting London's creative industries. Prior to running her own design-focused strategic consultancy service, Helen spent a decade working with Tom Dixon, ultimately leading a multidisciplinary team as Managing Director of the Design Research Studio. James Turner is the founder of award-winning creative collective, Glimpse. With over 2,000 members worldwide, James is also the creator of Choose Love Store Concept, raising over 2.5 million pounds for UK charity Help Refugees. Prior to this, he was communications director at Greenpeace International and the Syria Campaign. Ansel Nichols is the co-founder of Let's Be Brief and creative director at community engagement agency, 20% Extra. Since opening in 2009, the agency has built up a diverse portfolio of client projects, including Royal Foundation, Soho House Group, British Council, Channel 4, Legal and General, and Louis Vuitton. Ansel is also an associate lecturer at Chelsea College of Arts. Lara Kinnear is a designer, the leader of the Cities program at the London School of Architecture, founder of Place Agency and co-founder for Collaborative Change. She's also a ministerial advisor for architecture policy in Northern Ireland and coordinator for UN Habitat, UNI. She worked across public, private, civic and academia sectors in a variety of roles across the UK and abroad. Thank you, Deborah, for the introduction and to everyone for dis joining our discussion today, Zoom or Room, the future of collaboration. I'm Helen Arvanitekis, the director of the Design District. And um, I thought I'd start with a little personal note. And I think um, I've found the last few months to be a bit of a roller coaster experience involving quite a few infantile interruptions, haphazard internet from my service provider, um, including an intimate expose of all of the dusty corners of my home and peppered with a mild level of anxiety with um, critical presentations and pieces of work taking place in this environment. However, I think I've probably had it fairly lucky. So we at the Design District thought this might be an interesting topic to tackle today, particularly given that we deal very much with Room rather than Zoom as we work towards launching the district, which will have 150,000 square feet of physical workspace, specifically designed for creative industries. We've all seen extraordinary shifts in our working patterns in an extraordinary, extraordinarily short period of time. And I think for most of us, this was marked initially with a great sense of relief, relief that the tech does actually work most of the time, relief that our people are safe and relief that we can carry on working from wherever we are. But I think that also probably quite a few of us are now feeling a bit tired about this approach and perhaps a little frustrated too particularly those that rely on the nuances in a room um, and that work in a way that's eased by very much working in close proximity to another human being. Um, and I think that's what we really wanted to discuss today. And I'm delighted to be having this conversation with Lara, Ansel and James. I've asked each of them to speak a little bit on their own initially. And then after that, we'll have a chat about the topic um, all together. But before I hand over to Lara, I wanted to ask two things of our audience. First of all, we're going to be holding a poll, Zoom or Room. So please vote now. Um, hopefully you will see at the bottom bar in um, your Zoom screen a, a place where you'll be able to place your vote. And we're going to hold the poll again at the end of the discussion, see whether or not there's been a change in, in view on this topic. And then second, please do feel free to share any questions that you might have in the Q&A box. We're hoping that we'll cover lots of these um, through the second half of the conversation today. And we'd love to see any chat that you're having in the chat function. So please do go ahead and use that too. Right, I've just had a poll pop up in front of my screen. So I am going to click on that and submit it. I'd hope you will all do the same and we'll get our first set of results very quickly. 
Um, and then meanwhile, I'm going to hand over to Lara, who's going to talk to us um, briefly first. Thanks, Lara. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak on this panel today. I'm, I'm really honoured to speak alongside such esteemed panellists. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background um, that hopefully explains some of the things I'm going to share um, today. Um, so I trained in architecture. Um, I've worked as a designer in a lot of non-design environments, whether that be in government or academia or third sector. Um, and it's been, th these industries have been with a built environment focus, but design hasn't necessarily been at the heart of the decision making. Um, and, you know, my mission has been to bring design and design thinking to places where I believe it can contribute value. And that's often been challenging. Um, and when I explain it to my architecture students, I explain it in the sense of being a design barrister. So pretending you're in a court of design justice, you have to try and understand the context, you have to build up evidence, you have to respond to others, often from different disciplines, you have to collaborate with other people, present your case and hopefully win. At the end of last year, just before we got hit with COVID, I'd had enough of trying to change things from the inside and in trying to reset existing systems and processes. I was, uh, to put it bluntly, frustrated. Um, I saw the needs in society getting even greater and the responses um, seemed to be getting harder to administer and to have impact. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I had some amazing experiences resetting existing systems of, of altering red tape, which you, know, you can get a real thrill from sometimes. Um, but I knew I'd come to a point of needing to step out and be part of creating something new because the change that I felt was needed wasn't happening quick enough. Um, so, uh, you know, at the end of this year, I started to think about uh, a, a structure that was more fit for purpose, that was focused on delivering change, um, that I kept hearing people profess such passion for, um, but I just wasn't seeing the action. And I think there's a lot of great thinking out there and a lot of great skills. Um, but I'm not sure there's enough of the joining together of these two worlds. You know, where is all the doing? Or at least why isn't there more talking about the doing? And the change and doing that I'm really passionate about is bringing much more understanding to the value of places and spaces and its huge potential for human impact, for improving the quality of life. And I believe we need to be much more real about what that impact is, how it's measured and how we learn from it which is, I guess, a reference back to that concept of a design barrister. So I've been building a model for a do tank as opposed to a think tank. It's a way to convert all the great thinking that is around into action to ensure it becomes active and it delivers change. And while it's focused on spatial change, um, the model of the do tank does that in a very different way to what is currently the norm. Uh, for a start, it is collaborative. And when I say collaborative, I, I mean collaborative beyond the friendly architect, developer, engineer relationship to something that addresses the social, economic, environmental and spatial conditions that I think we need to address in order to deliver the sort of change that improves quality of life. So think of the architect and the behavioural scientist or the citizen and the economist or the politician and dare I say it, the philosopher having a discussion about what we want to see in the places that we inhabit. Um, because we do need all of those conditions working together if we want to have the sort of impact that is needed. Um, and I think one of the big things that collaboration needs or collaboration that is much broader beyond our usual industry is very different, a, a very different sort of communication. So a big part of the model development of the do tank is in creating new forms of communication. So as I was thinking about all of this, COVID hit and the world as we knew it changed. And amongst the many challenges and incredibly difficult situations people find themselves in, we also saw people rising to the challenge of responding to need in communities, in businesses, whether that be locally or globally. And in relation to the do tank, 
I saw two major areas of growth that I continue to see as being incredibly positive and opportunistic for where we hopefully will go next, um, which lo and behold are the topics of this discussion, communication and collaboration. So there are two um, project, pilot projects that we're running at the minute as part of establishing the do tank that I'm going to share with you um, quickly now just to demonstrate how communication and collaboration seems to be a really um, uh, positive outcome from, from COVID. So the first project is one that I co-founded called Collaborative Change. It's a platform to gather, share, celebrate and investigate collaborative working that demonstrates and delivers innovation and social impact. We've seen from lockdowns across the world an outpouring of action and a remarkable response to urgent need, from meals for people at risk to emergency accommodation for rough sleepers. And at the heart of these responses has been successful collaboration with innovative ideas for multidisciplinary working, different delivery methods and means of communication that cut across the usual red tape. So when I saw this outpouring and thought about the last 15 years working in um, various sectors, I thought, well, here's what I've been spending 15 years doing. And yet in the last five months, we have seen that sort of approach multiplying. So this is a, a really opportune moment to gather all these examples to show people that change is possible, that we can work together differently and improve people's lives. Um, so the, the platform is there really to celebrate what's been done and to further investigate what it took to make some of these collaborations happen. And very quickly, one of the, the most interesting <clears throat> collaborations was between Mercedes and UCLH when they uh, worked together to try and create a new ventilator system. And it, when, when we asked the questions as to understand how the collaboration came about, um, it, it was because they were neighbours in the city, so they had a physical relationship. Mercedes knew that they were next to UCLH, so they called them up and said, hey, we're neighbours, let's collaborate, let's try and make something good happen. And I think that, that's maybe something we'll, we'll talk about later in the talk, the importance of having physical relationships, not just one-to-one um, -one with people, but also in the city, and how that can lead to great things. Um, the second project is one that um, hasn't got a defined name yet because it's still being developed, but it's the idea of having a local room, um, establishing a digital and physical space in a part of London that has already gone through dramatic change, of which will continue for quite some time. And the idea is to have a physical space that brings together diverse knowledge bases using digital tools and the variety of consultants involved and the public to create a new form of placemaking around a very differently structured placemaking table where everyone is equal. Uh, the digital and the physical working, um, they have to work together to enable this to happen. And it's not really a new revolutionary proposal, um, but there is a new bubbling up of commitment to this sort of um, change of approach. Um, and there's certainly, certainly the technology has been around for a long time. Google Street View is 23 years old. Uh, the first ever fully interactive 3D model of London uh, is five years old. So we've had the technology for a while, but we're suddenly seeing um, certainly a change in mindset to embrace that new technology in new ways. Um, and I think we've seen that across placemaking and planning in particular, which is um, the field I tend to to work in, uh, suddenly we've leapfrogged from planning applications being communicated on lampposts on our streets to suddenly having virtual planning committees and signing off developments via video calls. So we really are seeing an upsurge in action and delivery um, that has been on the table for the past few years. And I think that's, a, that's something that we need to carry on. Um, so just to sum up, um, we know that there's great need. We've seen that in the last few months and we've seen that we need a significant amount of change to happen. Um, to quote Malcolm Gladwell, um, the 20th century was about lone geniuses, whereas the 21st is about smart people working together. And as you might have picked up by now, I really believe in the power of collaboration to change. And we are seeing new attitudes to the use of technology um, which is wonderful. 
but just like the Mercedes example, we're also seeing the need to, to continue to have physical connections. Collaboration requires face-to-face -face time just as, it, as much as it can take, um, it can make the most of new opportunities virtually. Um, those chance encounters in the coffee queue are still really important or in the lift or when you pass someone's desk and you start up a conversation with them. So I think it's about Zoom and Room, not either or. Um, it's about virtual and reality coming together, which I thought could somehow make a new word, something like ver real. Um, but I'm sure someone else can come up with a better word. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was brilliant. And I think I'm hoping you'll be able to see right now our first um, set of results. And um, perhaps maybe not too surprisingly, we've got a result of 77% of people um, on this chat think that um, the room is definitely superior to Zoom. Um, but I, I think you've made some really interesting points um, there, Laura, which I'm going to pick up with you um, shortly. But first of all, we're going to hear now from Ansel. Hello. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, some really interesting points there. I'm a particular fan of Mercedes, so that one resonates with me, given that I'm a Lewis Hamilton advocate. But anyway, we'll discuss that much later. <laughs> Very different conversation. Um, I'm going to switch to um, a screen, so if you just bear with me just a moment. Um, share that. Let me know if you can see my screen. Is that? Yep, that's a super pink desktop, maybe. That's not what we're hoping to go for. Let's have a look. Um, let's try that again. There is my document. There we go. Bash. Ooh. There we go. It's nothing like the world of a Luddite to keep things interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, thanks for having me again. Um, I am co-founder of 20% Extra and Let's Be Brief, um, two entities that kind of work harmoniously, hopefully on occasion, kind of to kind of facilitate one another in terms of our work as creative um, entrepreneurs and thinkers and teachers and tr community builders essentially. Now collaboration is one of those interesting things that have been a really key component of our work and our working practice. Now this image is of me and my wife because when we say when I say I'm a co-founder I'm a co-founder with my wife um, Stephanie McLaren Nichols who, who I work with every day. We live together, we have a daughter together so I literally bring my work home, my work is everywhere I go but Thankfully, it is something that we have chosen as a very conscious decision. And I think collaboration is about that. A lot of very conscious decision making and understanding who you're in the room with, why you're in the room with them and what values you bring to that particular conversation. Um, and one of the questions I'm always asked, as Helen did ask me when we discussed this earlier, was how do you do it? How do you work with your significant other? And I think one of the first things I offer as a piece of advice is delegation, roles and responsibilities. Initially, there was a lot of tension um, with us in terms of our ideas and the clash and a, and, a, and a real kind of friction initially of how to kind of create a harmonious working relationship. And what we realized that as once we were able to establish a working practice whereby we had responsibilities for various areas of our business, we were able to then collaborate in a much more harmonious manner whereby we had equal value for one another's ideas, but then there was ultimately the task of going away and doing something and, and making that thing happen. Um, so let's be brief. We're a platform that upskills and champions creative community and 20% Extra, as mentioned, was a, is a community engagement consultancy um, that helps clients talk with and not just to their audience. Now, let's be brief is about a community building exercise, which definitely helps to facilitate much of our creative work as an agency. So um, it means we're able to meet like-minded thinkers, makers, doers, and then bring them into a virtuous cycle of work and working practice. And to find the people you ultimately want to be able to work with over time. Because as I said, collaboration is very much about the conscious choice, knowing who and why you're in the room with people and recognizing the value of that relationship and recognizing the distinctions between your skill sets and your mindset and how that can kind of move towards some type of harmonious creative output or cultural output as it were. Um, and who am I? 
But I'm Ansel, as I said, generally tired. I'm a dad, husband, and also associate lecturer at um, Chelsea College of Arts. Um, and this is a really interesting interplay between my work as a creative practitioner and my work as a lecturer, because what I'm doing through my lecturing essentially is trying to take my experience of developing creative projects and recognizing the kind of really challenging timeframes and, and emotional processes and then helping young creatives establish their own sense of self within their work and within their kind of collaborative environment, which is i.e. their other students that they work with and spend time with, to create a more harmonious kind of working practice that enables them to build and grow into their truest creative selves and their truest selves from an earlier stage than maybe I was once able to be able to manage um, moving into industry and then finding my way through that industry in kind of, uh, well, it, it was to say the least a tr an intrepid journey. I think it was very much about tiny steps being kind of low in confidence at particular moments. And it's about how we can grow confidence to then work effectively with each other um, within a creative framework. Um, and we say this, which is a matter of just getting your fingers dirty and getting your hands dirty. And what we're finding now is about creative, is a, we're in a cultural space where creative community is definitely about making it for themselves. And I think the current economic and social climate dictates that we work with a more kind of, um, self-starter approach when it comes to building and making and build creating our own brands and ideas that we want to see happen in the world and realizing that they're really not going to happen unless we put our own respective shoulders to the wheel um, some of our clients but what i wanted to talk through um, with this session is about how collaboration works and the kind of fears pitfalls and opportunities that exist within the kind of process of what it means to collaborate now i remember once delivering a lecture at university of arts and i remember looking out towards a group of young bright-eyed students and we discussed the idea of collaboration and what came back to me was this kind of inherent look of fear across the whole body of students and what we realized was they were very much in some cases unsure of themselves and therefore unsure as to how they could add value to a creative environment. So what we've spent time doing with our work and through our practice is to establish how we can find and establish our best self within a communal environment to then hopefully move forward within that, within that context. And what we try and do is we look at these three essential pillars, which is what it means to listen, to talk and to communicate openly and more importantly than anything else is to create and make decisive actions, hence Chuck Norris at the bottom. And then being able to recognize that cycle after having made and taken actions, how to then reflect upon them, listen to feedback, listen to our audience and the people that we're actually designing for, to then subsequently create better work over time. So it becomes this virtuous cycle of creativity. Now, some of you may recognize some of these elements when it comes to what we call collaborophobia, that fear of collaboration, sharing ideas with one or more individuals, what it means to put yourself above the parapet as it were, um, and what it means to be a jack of all trades, to not necessarily recognize or be open to the fact that I can't do everything. Um, idea rejection hysterics, again, the fragility of what it means to put our most sensitive creative selves out there in the world to be judged, and acute concept control. These are very clear designed medical conditions, which I'm sure you'll find in any, any, any respected medical journal. But these are things that we've definitely found amongst creative community. I've definitely recognized in myself. And these are the things that we're actively working to address. And it's about trusting people who are better than you, working with a team that has a variety of skill sets, which enhance and augment your creative practice, um, letting go of your ego, and probably more than anything, to set a brief and not to understand what the absolute outcome is over time. Because I think every project and every working process is about an evolution and evolutionary thinking. Um, and then it also involves, we're talking about Zoom or Room, digititis, this connection to technology, which can sometimes inhibit our ability to be, to be creative. And, is, and when I say creative, I mean creative in the world, to be able to live and to breathe and to recognize that all of our influences, the ride to work, the flowers, the plants, the smile of your the person next to you in the shopping queue all of these things play a part in how we design and who we're designing for and it's recognizing that technology isn't always the answer 
and procrastinitis. It's about just getting things done and getting over that first hurdle and making that first step. Um, and stepping out of yourself um, and finding the confidence over time. And this is what I do through my university work is helping students to understand and to build confidence so they can then add value to a creative process. So you don't want to be like Homer. We want to climb out of that hedge. We want to kind of present our best self. But this takes time and it takes practice. And it's kind of dealing with doubt over confidence. Yeah? This is the reality of so many of us as creatives and collaborators, how we address that doubt and present that confidence but recognize that the two are kind of have a natural interplay and we shouldn't really be shy or reticent to discuss either. And we all need reassurance. So much of what we do in a collaborative environment is about reassuring our team members and our working partners that their ideas, good or bad, at any particular point have value. Because as um, a member of Mercedes, one of the chief technical directors there spoke, speaks about the idea of um, finding resolution in any creative concept. Every idea has value if there is a resolution. If we can work towards something and take it to its final point, then we can always see what works and what doesn't. And that reassurance enables people to take risks. And risks is how we get to the place where we create things that really matter in the world. And it's recognizing also that we all start from different points, but we're heading in the same direction. And collaboration is about that. It's about different lived experiences moving in a, in a, in a particular symbiotic kind of manner to get to a place of, of, of results and resolution. And it's recognizing that that is essentially the nub of collaboration and that there will be friction at various points along that journey. But these are the things we really need to be able to embrace. Um, and it's about finding confidence in our distinctions. Now, if at the center of this particular illustration exists the center, the mainstream, the kind of culturally dominant concept, and you are that little light blue um, dot on the right hand, on the left hand side, you might see yourself as bearing a certain level of insignificance in relation to that culturally dominant force. So what we have to look at are various things. For instance, if you lack work experience, what do you have at your disposal? You know, and it's about if you lack experience of the workplace, you have a very different lived experience maybe to your colleagues and that lived experience is what we then bring to the party and enable you to become the center of a conversation. And it's about recognizing your authentic lived experience and how that can play its part in a collaborative working process. And then you're able to speak with authority based on those experiences and how they feed into a certain form of creative output. And it's about being your own true self, being at the center of your own existence. Very difficult, it's an existential debate, but one that we see as being key to this collaborative working process. And we also see this as an opportunity to be able to tell your truth, your own truth in certain situations whereby you know, you're wondering, do I put that idea on the table? Do I present that concept for fear of it being put down? Well, no, every opportunity is that opportunity to tell your truth. And I'm gonna give you just two quick examples of projects that I've worked on where we've enabled and given young, young students and practitioners the opportunity to tell their truth and to grow into collaborative projects in as a result of a relationship with their own core knowledge. Now, this is one project we worked on with Louis Vuitton, which was working across a group of university, I'm sorry, museums from Royal Academy of the Arts to Tate Modern to um, South London Gallery and working with young people from each of these organizations to create a platform which celebrated young people's opportunities in the arts. So what we did initially was to give them the framework for what it meant to work and to create creative projects. And what they were then able to do firsthand was to present ideas of what they felt the project needed to be so they could feed it back to Louis Vuitton as a brand to say, this is what this collaborative project needs to be. This is what it needs to look like. And what they decided through that collaborative process that it needed to be a hub, not a closed community, and aimed at young people, but not exclusive to, like Harry Potter. Now, this was done through a process of boards all across the room whereby we asked them to put their own first word perspectives on subjects onto those pages and to see them build a proposition of a project that they initially might not have had a real personal connection to, but then to see how their personal perspectives of 
user interface design and what it means to use platforms and to be young people seeking careers and opportunities meant that their ideas had inherent value to that creative process. And what that created was a real sense of ownership and stakeholders, which in, in itself creates long-term creative value for any particular project. And it became a platform. This is probably one of the duller um, snapshots from the website, um, the about page, but it became a long-standing platform enabling that very thing, which is to um, give young people opportunities in the world of creativity and the arts. And it's about helping people to see their part in the puzzle. You know, and when we worked with the Royal Foundation, that was another really interesting example of us working with a number of stakeholders, which was, in this case, looking at underlying issues of youth violence. Now, what we were able to do was to speak to those in the know, those with on the ground experience, a very key part of that collaborative process. If you don't know, speak to somebody that does and understand their stories. It may give you a fresh perspective on your design outputs. And understanding experience and solutions and outcomes are kind of married as one cycle. So it's recognizing the day in the life of an individual, recognizing what design kind of things can be implemented in order to meet the needs of that individual. And that comes about through a really open collaborative workspace. And it might not even mean that the person you're collaborating with has a design background. It just means that they understand the experience of the end user. And this is about observations, recognizing what is poignant and pertinent in any situation. And there used to be a, um, a show when I was a kid, Police Five, and the guy at the end of the show used to say, keep them peeled. And this is about just being acutely aware of what conversations are taking place. And over time, recognizing that as a collaborator and as a person maybe leading a project, you are a facilitator. You are trying to create the open and free and flexible environment in order to allow people to thrive and to grow into their best creative selves and best communicative selves. And it is also about recognizing their fragilities in that particular moment. If they're not working and not used to working in this type of space, i.e. a digital space when they're used to being in the room, it's about making them comfortable, making them feel as though, you know, they're listened to even in this particular moment. And what it can also mean is direct eye contact and asking questions throughout that collaborative phase. That in itself keeps people acutely related to the some conversation. It might not necessarily, in some cases, for those that feel that they're wallflowers, as we show with that, um, Homer Simpson image, it's about bringing them to the fore, bringing them into a comfortable space where they're able to share and um, be very free with their concepts. And often we find that some of the most quiet individuals are the ones that offer most values to projects. Um, and just as I wind up just quickly, it's about immersing yourself in culture and working with people that are really acutely um, driven by culture and culture in all its forms from the political, the social, because the more you immerse yourself in culture, the more you will understand more of yourself and subsequently more of the subject that you're actually trying to um, work, work to change and then the environment that you're hoping to kind of enact and enable moving forward. And this is a statement from Kate Moross, a very kind of key practitioner in the world of design. This is my lovely graphic, which, which enables that, that, that sentiment, hopefully quite, quite beautifully, but it's about keeping your toes dipped in culture, keeping your toes dipped in the conversations that matter, not seeing them as something distinct from your creative practice and recognizing that at any one point, those wider cultural conversations can then have a direct relationship with the work that you produce. Thank you, Ansel. I'm gonna no problem. stop you there. I've got a million questions that I want to ask yep. you. Um, that was brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm now gonna ask James to, um, take over, take hold of the mic, so to speak, and um, uh, tell us a little bit more about Glimpse. Yeah, very happy to do that. Thank you, Ansel. Would love to pick up on, on that point about culture as well, but I'll do that in a little while. Um, so just quite briefly, because I'm, I'm really keen to get to questions as quickly as we can. Um, my name's James Turner. I'm the co-founder of Glimpse, which is a creative collective which aims to show a glimpse of, uh, we call it the more beautiful world that we know is possible. Uh, but essentially the idea is 
how can we help people imagine and understand that the solutions to environmental and social problems could leave us with a better world than the one we have now so a kind of different approach to charity or cause-based campaigning um, and Lara spoke a little bit about her background and just very briefly it feels relevant to talk about I started out as a journalist and then went to work for Greenpeace um, in the communications department there um, and worked on a bunch of different campaigns but um, the, the main one that I focused most of my time on was called Save the Arctic. Um, and this was an attempt by Greenpeace to make climate change more understandable, uh, more relatable for people and essentially to turn it into a story. So we did a bunch of very dramatic kind of flashpoints against Shell, the oil company, which at the time was drilling for oil in the, in the far north, including um, putting a giant uh, polar bear puppet outside the headquarters in London, uh, which was fully animated and roared uh, at visitors as they came into the office. We worked with an artist called Chris Kelly on that one. Um, we ran a campaign against Lego to ditch their corporate partnership with Shell after 50 or so years um, because it didn't seem appropriate for a toy company to be promoting a, a, an Arctic drilling outfit. Um, as part of that, we created a film, which you may have seen, which involved Lego bricks being swallowed in oil uh, to the sound of everything is awesome, but in this kind of minor piano key. Um, and again, we with Don't Panic on that. Um, and then finally worked with an activist group in the US called the Yes Men, um, who famously uh, pretend to be companies and say things that the company would never say. And as part of that, we ran an advertising campaign online for Shell, where consumers were invited to write their own strap lines to different images of Arctic oil drilling. The whole thing obviously backfired on Shell. People wrote satirical um, messages and we caused a kind of PR nightmare for Shell, which they didn't actually create, but then they paid for. So what I learned from that was the ability of uh, the, the, the potential of working with creative people who have nothing to do with the environmental movement, but can bring their existing skills and talents into that space gave you transformative work. Um, and while Greenpeace is a very creative organization, it isn't structured like a design company. It's not structured like an advertising agency. Uh, it's structured like a kind of policy focused um, you know, think tank in a way with this amazing like direct action arm that does the kind of climbing on building stuff. So what struck me was, well, is there a way to design an environmental organization or a social justice organization which uses creativity as its founding principle, which is not how most NGOs work. So that's what we are trying to do with Glimpse. Um, and so just in short, Glimpse is a, a creative collective. We're open to people from all over the world who work in design, work in marketing, work in advertising, but want to use their existing skills on social or environmental projects. Um, and we run kind of events. So we've run a, a series of hack days in London where people are invited to um, come we write a creative brief which everyone works on we provide lunch 40 or 50 people get together they've never met before uh, and they might be working on a brief on consumerism that was the first one we did um, which if you're an advertising executive is quite fun to do on a Saturday afternoon um, and that process has led to some some pretty good ideas um, the first one being the cats campaign where we replaced every single advert in Clapham Common with a picture of a cat um, as a kind of uh, sort of a comment on the level of public advertising in London. Um, and that kind of process we've learned writing a brief without an NGO client or without a brand client leads to ideas that would never get signed off. They don't have the right level of policy detail. They don't have the right call to action, but people tend to like them. Um, and so that's something we're experimenting with. Um, obviously, over lockdown, that process has needed to change a lot. Um, and we ran a fully online, uh, open, collaborative process. Um, and the brief for this one was really simple, which is this pandemic, I think everyone on this call will realize it's made us think about what matters to us again, like what is truly important versus what does culture tell us is most important. Uh, and how might we give people the opportunity to talk about their reflections on what matters and what's most important in a way that feels authentic to them. So this uh, process led, and I'll talk about the process more, um, we did you know, open creative sessions, people from India, the US, all over the world taking part. One of the ideas that emerged was really simple, 
which is, well, we've heard so much from politicians at their lecterns telling us what we should do and where we should go. What would happen if we took a lectern into different parts of the UK and invited regular people um, to speak their mind? Um, and again, because we're glimpse, because we try and think about the positive, the, the framing for that was, well, what do you hope for? What are your hopes for the future? Um, and so uh, we built this project. We did a pilot in Tower Hamlets in East London with a community group there. Um, and uh, it was a fantastic project. I think we're going to show the trailer just to give you a sense of it. Um, but we can talk about it more in the questions. Um, so whenever you're ready, I think the trailer should be ready to roll. I believe everyone deserves to have a voice. I hope for a better future after the recent pandemic. I hope to live in a world where there's more happiness and freedom. I hope that every woman has the same opportunity as her peers around the world. I hope for young people to shape the world that they will inherit. Throughout lockdown, we've seen leaders take to their podiums to tell us what we should be doing. Where we can go. Who we should see. And how the future will unfold. But now, it's the people turn to have their say. People like me. Like me. Like me. Like me. The People's Podium will be travelling around the UK, and this morning it's arrived here in our community, in Tower Hamlets in London. Hope is incredibly important, because it's something to hold on to, even in the hardest times. Now it's our time to show you how loud we truly are. This period had exposed the amount of inequalities in our society. My hope for the future is to rewild our spaces. I hope for a world where kindness is at the front of everyone's mind. I feel angry when I see people in Palestine suffering and struggling. Supporting and inspiring women is fundamental to our community. Your gender, your sexuality, your religion, your skin don't change who you are. Let's build a new and stronger future together. The truth is, you are not powerless. They can't put us on mute. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> it's our chance to talk about what we hope for. For ourselves. Our community. And the wider world. The People's Podium could be coming to your community next. So what do you hope for? Pass over to you. Amazing. Thank you, James. That's so fantastic to see. We, we talked about it, but I hadn't actually seen the show reel. So, um, and again, really interesting um, piece of work and um, talk. So, uh, and I will come back to you with some questions, but I thought we would um, go back to um, Lara, if we may, and um, uh, just go back to some of the points that Lara was talking about. Um, I, I love the reference that you made to um, uh, your new um, startup as, um, describing it as a do tank rather than as a think tank. I think that's just a, a completely fantastic alternative point of view. Um, but I, I'd be quite keen to explore maybe in a little bit more detail what, um, what that actually means and what the process behind doing rather than thinking means um, in, in real life and, and um, I, I also wanted to kind of tie that back into the really interesting comment um, you made about working with your neighbours and that interesting um, uh, example of Mercedes and UCLH teaming up together because they were next door neighbours. How do you find your neighbour in this environment? And, um, you know, how can we make sure that, that finding our neighbours enables us still to do our best work? Yeah, well, I think um, from Mansell's and, and James's presentation, you know, they're clearly doing. Um, and so when I say do tank rather than think tank, it, it's it, you need the thinking before you do the doing. Um, I just want to try and create a model which allows the thinking to be translated into doing. So it's really inspiring to see how James is providing a platform for a lot of people to be thinking and developing ideas and forming ideas. I'm really interested in how you can then take those ideas and deliver them, how you can change the red tape, how you can change policy, um, how you can encourage people to take risks. And I think that really picks up on what Ansel was saying about the fragility of collaborating, of thinking outside the box, of thinking outside how your organization works. 
um, of thinking outside how you were taught in university. Um, because let's face it, we're taught in silos. We're, we're taught even in primary school in silos. We're not really taught how to connect all the dots together. So uh, there's quite a fundamental change that I think we need to go through. But, but I think that, um, you know, the, the fragility aspect can be resolved and, and almost through COVID we've seen how people have have resolved it because they've seen that new ways are needed and that they are possible and that people are suffering at the end of the day so so there has been that rising up which I think is fantastic um your second question what was that remind me sorry um it was probably about finding your neighbor yes 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 <laughs> In the digital world, I've got no one next yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> no one that really picks up also what Ansel said about um, collaboration being a conscious choice. And, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, so how do we make those conscious choices in a digital world? Because it's, it feels easier to do in a, in a real world uh, when you're seeing people every day or you're, you're able to build relationships face to face. And it, I've definitely noticed in in projects I've been working on over the last few months that if you have a prior relationship with someone, it's a lot easier to now work with them digitally. But if you're starting afresh with people, when you're starting through a screen, it's more challenging. You have to put in a lot more effort. Um, so I think that how you make those conscious choices um, does become harder digitally, but I still think there's ways around it. And I, I one quick example on that is, I've been working with UN Habitat for about the past eight years. They have been reliant on working digitally for, for their entire existence because they bring people together from around the world. Now, I, you can only do so much through the you know, virtual platforms, but what has I've, I've seen over the years been instrumental is that every two years we have a conference where everyone comes uh, together. And in, those, in that conference, you have those conversations in the coffee queue. You build up a relationship with, which then lasts you the two years that you have virtually before the next conference. So I don't think it takes much, but I do think you need those significant moments where you come together physically and you build the relationships that then can carry you through whatever happens when you're not neighbors. Amazing, thank you. Um, so Ansel, I um, wanted to touch a little bit on the comments that you were making about confidence and um, uh, having confidence in our own creative ability and, and demonstrating that through our process. Um, we, we also, when we met before this, we talked a little bit about the ability to be able to hide in an environment like this. I mm -hmm. think particularly, particularly in teaching, you were saying, you know, you can, you can see the students who are able to withdraw perhaps to the yes. back of their screen and, and, and really kind of avoid interrogation or, or collaboration. And I, I was wondering, um, what can we do, you know, assuming that we're facing an environment working like this, um, uh, at least for, for a, a, a significant period ahead, possibly, you know, forever, this may be a permanent change. How can we nurture that um, creative young talent in particular? And how can we ensure, reassure those, those people starting out to take the risks to allow themselves to develop through that risk taking and being confident in their own ideas? First thing I always like to stress with students, particularly in this instance, is that opinions are muscles. You have to exercise them. Um, you have to put your ideas out there so as to be able to initiate a conversation and to then willingly um, accept feedback based on those opinions. And as we say, only experience tells you over time whether or not your ideas are good or bad. But until you air those opinions and those concepts and those thoughts, you will never know because you will only ever live in your head. So what I try and do and what we try and I try and encourage is to start making those mistakes at an ever earlier stage, to start sharing your opinions at an ever earlier stage. And if you're in the case of a university student in amongst your peers, do it in safe spaces, you know, do it with those whose opinions that you respect and those who respect you and build the confidence and the resilience to not only be able to reflect upon what's good in your thinking, but also what 
can be improved and to take those that feedback with an objective pinch of salt and i think the more you can do that the more you can start to share and think about why you think something as much as what you think is the why which is very important because somebody will say something is good or it's bad and, and the next question is always why and that's always the question that stumps a lot of people and i say with well, the why is what dictates and defines you as a designer because design is a conscious choice just as collaboration is you're making lots of conscious choices and you need to be able to understand why you're making those decisions now having that conversation with yourself and then having an honest conversation with your peers is what enables you to build that resilient barrier to be able to move forward with a career and to be able to then call it a career rather than a box of Mr. Majika tricks you're constantly trying to reach into to kind of hopefully pull something magical out that looks and sounds good. Well, only when you start hearing yourself speak will you know what looks and sounds good. You know, so it's an exercise. Keep doing it, keep doing it at an ever earlier stage. And by the time you get to the important moment, you'll be ready for it. So brilliant very very wise words very uplifting thank you ansel um james i the 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 um show reel was absolutely fantastic it was so um uh enlightening and also refreshing to actually see real opinions from a real community um i i think what i was keen to find out a little bit more from you about was um uh, you talking about your previous experiences, I think most mostly at Greenpeace where you would be working with a creative agency and um, uh, Greenpeace being the client and then possibly with um, a um, concern or a, or a target, let's call it, um, that, that um, uh, kind of would lead the output of that collaboration. Um, how how has your working with your collective in this digital world enabled you to have that similar um or to enabled you to be able to reach those that same degree of complexity in your ideas but also conviction in the output that you're creating as well yeah i mean i wish i could say it has uh, i think that the, the switch to digital you know while there are advantages like we you know when we organize these hack days you've got to get food for 50 people and you've got to find a space that will volunteer it and you've got to have a guest list on the door and there's a lot of faff involving you know getting a lot of people together um i think if i'm per perfectly honest like digital collab creative collaboration is a pale imitation of being in a room with someone that's just like worth admitting at this stage um what it has done though is open up the opportunity for people who don't live in london or for whatever reason can't get to the space to take part and that is huge and shouldn't be underestimated um i also think going back to ansel's point about confidence there is something less threatening um about appearing in a this kind of forum than showing up with a bunch of strangers and feeling like you might be put on the spot in front of lots of people so i think you know we try and think about introverts a lot in how we design our processes and I do think there are some advantages there for sure um, but you know when we go back to Greenpeace actually the most fruitful collaborations if I'm honest were not with agencies they were with individual creatives who were motivated to come and work with us almost outside of their normal work because as soon as you get stuck into the kind of awards matrix then and like agency process versus NGO or charity process that's where it all grinds to a halt um, and a little bit like with collaborating with with the point of glimpse meetings is you are not here as the ECD of your big agency you're here to sit next to um, you know a student who's just started in graphic design and both of you have equal uh, voices in this space and that's really important again you know Ansel talked about ego getting the egos out of the room and saying what matters here is the process the conversation and the ideas um, and I think that's what's again quite hard to do uh, when you're on a zoom call yeah yeah that's so true I think um, that there was a question um, in Q&A which I think actually probably dovetails quite nicely with that which is um, around the um, the social staircase or the collision coefficient in the office space. It's that idea of bumping in someone at the coffee machine or the recycling bin and, and um, a conversation there might, might spark you to go off in a different direction. And um, 
uh, I know for me personally, I'm really missing that, the fact that you can actually get something fantastic done in probably in quite a short period of time or by accident almost. And I was just wondering if any of you have had any um, positive experiences in this digital realm that enable us to, um, to somehow recreate the, the coffee conversation. I think, I think in some ways it's already there. It's just we haven't maybe connected the dots because, you know, I was thinking about Facebook and, um, you know, I belong to a local park users group um, on Facebook. And you realise that, you know, that's where a lot of people come together, have chats, talk about their dogs, talk about, you know, litter in the park, whatever, and where they start to... Um, suggest changes improvements and work together someone got locked in the park the other night someone came with a key to let them out you know so i i guess we have some tools already there that we perhaps just haven't brought into our new professional online worlds um and and uh, i think the idea of the social staircase is brilliant analogy and and there's definitely more we can do with it but i just wonder if we just need to reconnect some some areas of our digital world that has predominantly been personal up until now and bring it into our everyday work. Yeah, I think there's definitely a degree of that. I mean, I don't know, um, James or Ansel, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we've got one minute to go. I don't know if either of you've got something that you want to add to yeah, that. Yeah, I was just going to say that having worked with students online, particularly during this COVID lockdown, it means you, I've had to work much harder to establish a relationship and an, and, an, and an understanding of where they are in their heads and their minds. And you've had to look past all of the things that you can take for granted when you're in physical proximity, which is obviously massively important, but then you have to really find out how somebody is and you have to learn about somebody so as to be able to then move into the conversation space, which is centered around work and working practice. And it means you're then able to learn some surprising things about people who you think you know pretty well, just by not actually knowing. <laughs> You know, given the fact you can't see them, you're not in their space. You've got to know whether the, you know, whether they've, how far their shops are, how inconvenient it has been for them to, you know, um, to just just go to go for a walk and to have exercise and to be well. And that caring lends itself to a whole host of other more open, creative conversations. People yeah. become a lot freer and looser, and I think that's what's been the benefit for me in this time. That's true. Thank you, Ansel. James. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, that, that I'm constantly worried about my one year old daughter walking in, in the door behind me or like <laughs> leaving my washing up or and I think that blurring of the boundaries between me as a human being and me as a professional who needs to show up for meetings is actually a real step forward. And, and maybe this is sure. going to lead to less of a, a, an enforced division and a sense so. of a more holistic approach to our work, to our lives. That's definitely one of the positives. And I, th I don't think any of us should be ashamed of having our dirty laundry in our, on our Zoom calls. No. I think there's definitely something to learn from that. Thank you. <laughs> um, that has been absolutely fantastic. I wish we could go on for at least another hour, but unfortunately we're going to have to stop it there. I'm so very grateful to Lara, Ansel and James for taking part and for Deborah for having us here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.